let's say that you're in a somewhat big company. And let's say that this company has some customer service data. That data might include some complaints, maybe some feature requests, or general help queries. Now let's also assume that, that this company is interested in making their first virtual assistant. Well then, it feels natural to consider that maybe among these customer service requests, that there might be some inspiration that you can have for intents. Now, it probably will not be a perfect one-to-one -one match because a customer service channel on social media is bound to receive different data than a virtual assistant on a website. But I hope you might agree that there's something to be said that maybe we can do something to inspire us to at least get the first intents going, and that can be a great starting point. The question might be though, how do you get from this customer service data into this nice little summary of intents? So what I would like to do in this video is demonstrate a trick that I like to call bulk labeling. It won't be perfect, but it might make it a whole lot faster to go from an unlabeled pool of customer service data to some intents that you might want to focus on. To explain how the trick works, I've created a Jupyter Notebook. But the way that this trick is going to work is we are going to be combining two libraries. The What Lies library that we've seen before in this series of videos, and a library that has a user interface element called Human Learn. And full disclaimer, I'm the maintainer of both of these projects. If you want to get started, you need to install both of these tools. You can do that with this line over here. But the idea of the notebook is to use what lies to generate embeddings for sentences that we might have received from customer service, and to then use a user interface tool to use this representation for labeling. In particular, in this demo, I'll be using a couple of embedding sources. I'll be using count vectors, byte pair embeddings, and the universal sentence encoder. And as a demo data set, what I have done is I have collected data from the Raza demo bot. I've removed all of the labels and I'll be having a look at all the chit chat text that is there in that assistant. And I'm using this as a demo and the idea is that we're going to deal with about a thousand examples. The way that all of this is going to work is I'll be taking each sentence that's in that text file I'll pass that through a language backend such that I have a embedding. Next, what I'm going to do is I'll be using the UMAP dimensionality reduction technique. It's similar to PCA. The main difference is that it's a nonlinear reduction technique. And I will then have two dimensional data points that I can chart. And the main idea here is that I have a flow to go from text to hopefully something that is clustered, maybe in such a way that I can automatically see which main clusters exist in my text data. And I've got a demo running of exactly this right here. Here is a chart that shows the two-dimensional representation of the count vectors of all of my text. Here, I've got the same thing, but for byte pair embeddings instead. And here, I've got the reduced representation for my universal sentence encoder. Now, if I hover my mouse over some of these data points, it does look like similar texts are clustered together. Here I see a small cluster about language. If I move up here, it is asking about whereabouts and, and where the assistant is from. And if I move here, it seems to be asking about age, name, and birthplace. Now these clusters that we see in the count vector representation are based on words that are being used in a sentence. This might make some clusters appear that are logical. Like below over here, we have lots of questions about language. The only downside is it's probably just the word language that it's using to base these clusters on. So that also means that we are going to get clusters like these where the word what is being used even though asking about someone's age and asking about a birthplace are technically seen two different topics. So we get clusters, but maybe we can get more meaningful clusters if we use text embeddings. And just by looking at the shape of the clusters that appear, 
it does occur to me that perhaps we are gaining something when we go from count vectors to the byte pair embeddings. And note that these byte pair embeddings are pre-trained on Wikipedia, so they may be able to give us more information than just which words appear in a sentence. And this also explains why the clusters appear to be more pronounced in this chart. There's definitely a cluster over here that seems to be all about language. The cluster over here that's about food and restaurants also seems nice and distinct. But it's still not necessarily perfect. Here we have questions about name, the name of the father of the assistant, and birthplace once more. The downside of bipair embeddings is that it's still based on the vocabulary, which is still based on the word. So it might be overfitting slightly on the word what, as opposed to the word birthplace. And one thing that's nice about these visualizations in What Lies is that I can zoom in to explore this further and further. And I do want to acknowledge that the clusters themselves aren't half bad, but at times it's still a lot of work to mentally separate these clusters. If instead we use the universal sentence encoder, we won't merely take the sum of these word vectors to come to an embedding of a sentence, but instead we're able to take context from the entire sentence because of the attention mechanism that is inside the universal sentence encoder. If we go from by pair to here, we definitely see that there's even more distinction between a lot of these clusters. And if I hover my mouse over some of them, I see a nice little cluster here that seems to be about jokes. There's a distinct cluster here that's all about the time. I've got a cluster about restaurants and food here. I've got age and when you were born. And again, I can zoom in on some of these clusters if I'm interested. So for example here, I can see that it's mostly about weather, but I should remind myself that these clusters aren't perfect. If I move my mouse slightly upward here, I get what's up. So by and large, these clusters seem to have meaning but I shouldn't expect these clusters to be at all perfect. If I think back of the use case though, I'm starting out with a big data set and I'm just interested in understanding what intents are in there, then I hope you might recognize that it might not be a bad idea to just say, well, let's put a circle around this cluster, look at the examples that are in there, and then give that cluster a name. And since these clusters here are nice and distinct, that might be a very nice way to think about maybe attaching our first labels. Again, it's definitely not going to be a perfect labeling scheme. It should really just be seen as a starting point, but it is a very nice way of exploring a data set. And it might be a big time saver, especially if you're just starting out. Assigning these circles and labels though, that is something that right now doesn't exist in what lies just yet. However, it is one of the core features from this other package called human learn. So what we're going to do now is we're going to recreate this chart over here, but now in human learn such that we can easily attach labels. So here is the same chart as before, but now it's in a chart created by human learn. The way that this works is that we have taken our universal sentence encoder language. We have given it all of our texts and then we have applied UMAP onto it. This is then moved into a data frame. And the idea is that the interactive charts object from human learn can take that data frame and put that in this display where we can actually make some drawings. Now the chart that we have here is built on top of Bokeh, which allows for this polygon draw tool over here. What you can do is you can activate it and then you can double click to start drawing click, 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 and then, and then you can double click to indicate that you're done drawing. And you've then got this drawn shape that you can move around if you'd like. But the main thing that you can use this for is easily select a cluster of points. Now the current selection is stored inside of this charts object over here. And that means that I can retrieve the rows that I've just selected. I'm doing that in the code block below here. What I'm showing here is the selected points, and I'm really only showing the top 10. Looking at the text though, I'm kind of confident that everything that's in here probably is about restaurants. 
It certainly feels, by and large, that we have a restaurant cluster here. So that means that I can go down, give the name of the label that I would like to attach. And because these selected indices can be used to override the original data frame, I can run this cell to actually assign this label. And the way that this notebook is set up is I can now scroll back up again, rerun this one cell, and the cluster that I just labeled is now gone, which means that I can continue labeling the other clusters that are in here. Let's look at this one. So these are all about, it's nice to meet you. So I'll say nice to meet. And again, if I were to rerun this, that cluster is now gone. Now, we should observe that these clusters won't necessarily be perfect. I can zoom in maybe here. There might be one or two clusters here. But the nice thing about this user interface and flow is that I can also inspect this as a human and kind of have a qualitative angle at my disposal. If I just zoom in on these and I check them out, then it seems to be about, hey, are you a bot? And if I were to move this maybe over here, it certainly seems like that's more about the weather. So I can say, okay, that's the weather. And I can go back here and indeed say, this is challenge whether or not you're a bot. Now, what's nice about this is this is a reasonably fast and interactive way of labeling. We can export a data frame that has all of the texts and the labels that we've just attached. That said though, we should remember that if we have a cluster over here, that might be a useful intent, but certainly the language that people use in a customer feedback form is bound to be different than how customers like to talk with a digital assistant. This tool is really only meant as a helpful starting point. The labels that are generated should not be seen as a gold standard in any way or form, and you'll still want to label on a more granular level as you get actual user feedback. So there are limits to this approach. What I really like about this approach though, is that labeling is only part of the goal here. Another big part of the goal here is to understand your data. And doing your first analysis this way, to me at least, is very much a qualitative and human task. It's not necessarily about labeling many data points, it's also about exploring your own data set and understanding what your customers are asking for. Another point that I would like to highlight is that currently I've done everything just in English. And that's because the assistant that I had was written in the English language. But it should be stressed that you can repeat this exercise for any language that what lies supports. These byte pair embeddings are supported in over 270 languages. You can always try count vectors. And it should also be said that because we support hugging face models, we also support Arabic and many other languages that someone's made a model for. And what lies also supports TensorFlow Hub, so there's many multilingual language models at your disposal as well. So feel free to check out this notebook and to maybe play around with this method of bulk labeling. It's definitely something that I would argue is very experimental, but I would love to hear if people find this useful, and all feedback would certainly be welcome. <laughs>